Hey, what's up guys? How we doing? I'm back. Got another video tonight. This one is fun one. Well, I wouldn't say it's fun. This is a, this is a gnarly one. This is kind of a little bit deep. It gives you a, a, a perspective on how gnarly this sport is. How many guys have had serious injuries? And when I get real serious about, you know, getting these guys paid and getting them taken care of, getting them proper insurance, this is why. Look, uh, wait till you get to this. This is the list of the top 10 guys that I know of that had career ending injuries that would have done more. So here's your top 10. And uh, remember guys, subscribe, like, and if you need merch, I'll drop a, uh, a link in the description. Get yourself a hard truth shirt. I got some more stuff coming for the Cooksey Mob. Appreciate you guys. And uh, all right, well, let's, uh, let's drop this list of top 10 riders that had their careers cut short with injury. I'm in the empire business. Everybody love everybody! You all know exactly who I am. Number 10 on this list is Donovan Mitchell. No, not the guy that plays for the Jazz. Donovan Mitchell is a rider out of kind of the Northern California area who signed with Factory KTM was riding really good, went to the day in the dirt at LACR, and there was a crash that literally claimed him, Roderick Thane, uh, Ricky Johnson, Guy Cooper, Jeff Ward, you can't make this up, this happened, and unfortunately he suffered a spinal cord injury. He didn't get to ever make his pro debut. He signs with Factory KTM in the off season at day in the dirt gets hurt and doesn't get to ever race a race as a factory rider it's gnarly but the reason he's on this list is not because he had a whole bunch of results and, and didn't get to do it he never got any results but i look at what he's done he's got a business uh ebay business and his attitude and i just think he's a guy with that kind of determination he absolutely would have done something so donovan mitchell Factory KTM, number 10. All right, guys. Number nine on my list of riders whose careers were cut short with injury. Weston Pike. This dude is an absolute savage. Yes, he's well known for being the guy who beat up Vince Freezy on national TV. Um, he fought his way through his whole career. He got all the way up to the factory, you know, where he was getting podiums and actually heading into the season where he got hurt he's with jgr god he looked really good he was i think he was going to get a win like he he was that good it was just a freak accident at the paris supercross he crashed and as he kind of fell off the bike he landed face up on a landing of a jump and somebody was already in the air and essentially cased it on his face it was gruesome shattered his face took out his eye. I mean, he's so he's very, very lucky to be alive. Um, he's still here, but he has not ever raced professionally since then. He lost an eye and it was just a long, long recovery, but true to form, Weston's a complete badass. And I'll be honest with you, he can go out to the track one-eyed and smash most people. And I think he still does. So Weston Pike. Number eight on my list is the one and only Trey Kennard. Trey was so talented. Unfortunately, he had a series of really bad injuries. Broken femur, um, back injury. It just seemed like Trey could never stay healthy and it just, it definitely shortened his career. Uh, he's a guy that could have done a lot more. He did some really good things. He got a national championship. He got a regional supercross championship. He got actually a regional supercross championship in his first try, won his first supercross and beat Villapoto head to head in his first season. So how many guys can say that? Yeah, Trey Kennard was a badass. He did get a lot of racing in, but it was definitely cut short due to injuries. Number seven on my list, Brock Hepler. Do you guys remember Brock Hepler? He was a very highly touted amateur racer. I mean, he worked really hard. He didn't fatigue. He was Suzuki's hope coming up. He really was going to be the next guy. Um, unfortunately, he had a series of head injuries and was forced to retire after just a few years of being a pro. And just, it just didn't work out for Brock. But yeah, 
Rock is number seven on the list. And this guy showed up on a couple of lists so far, or at least you guys all talk about him. Danny Magoo Chandler. Dude, this guy was the first original pin it to win it guy. I mean, he just was full send all the time. And yeah, unfortunately it caught up with him. He was racing in Europe, just got a Kawasaki ride. He got off the KTM, got on a Kawasaki, and he felt like he had a legitimate shot at that world championship the next year. He's at the Paris Supercross, throws a whip, crashes, and damn it, if it doesn't get his neck and neck and back, and he's in a chair, and he's since passed away. But Danny Magoo Chandler is number six on the list of riders cut short. Man, oh, and do we not mention his designations? He was the first guy to ever win the, the designations in 250, 500, like, I don't know the details on that one, but I mean, it was, he dominated. He was such a badass. Number five on my list is Ernesto Fonseca. Ernesto is a complete badass. He worked so hard. The rumor has it when he got to the Supercross track, when he first learned Supercross, McGrath and the other guys were like, dude, is this guy a C rider? Like, is he even going to get around the track? Let alone win his first season on the two, like he, his first 125 season, he won the championship, like out of the blue. Then he won one again later on. And then he was on the, the 252 stroke for Honda, riding really good. He was consistently uh, a podium guy, battling for podiums. And I, I felt like he would have got a win before it was all said and done. But in the 2006 season, after the ninth round of Indianapolis, he had a practice crash in between and Unfortunately, it was a spinal injury and that ended his career. So, yeah, what a bummer. Number four on my list, Jesse Nelson. This one was really sad. Jesse is a guy who signed with Troy Lee Designs. And honestly, he was already overcoming some odds. Jesse was missing thumb or he had barely a portion of his thumb but he made it work. I mean, this guy won in 2015, he won in Anaheim. He was a guy that was a perennial contender in the lights class, and I just thought he had so much talent. He was so good. And in 2016, the Outdoor Nationals at Unadilla, there was a freak deal. They have those big yellow pylons that they mark the Outdoor National corners with. There was one on the inside, he clipped it, flipped, and broke his back. And unfortunately, that ended his career and I believe Jesse's been wheelchair bound ever since. He still does some stuff. I see him on Instagram launching his UTV. I mean, he's so uber talented. I mean, but yeah, what could have been? Um, this is a tough sport, guys. Man, it just, it's brutal that there's this many good riders on the list, so. Number three on this list of riders who had their careers ended by injury, Donnie Holeshot Hansen. This guy had just peaked in 1982. He won the Supercross, 250 Supercross, 250 Outdoor, just flying. And he goes to the Des Nations. He's the American Hope, which ironically, uh, the guy uh, further back on the list, Danny Magoo Chandler, only got onto the Des Nations team where he dominated because of the injury to Donnie Hansen. Donnie Hansen was practicing, hit his head, went into a coma and just never recovered and it ended up costing him his career. He never raced professionally again and it, it was tough. So Donnie Hansen, number three. Number two, the original bad boy, Rick Johnson. So we all know Rick Johnson had championships, Supercross championships, outdoor championships, you name it, Rick Johnson did a lot of it. He did a lot of winning. Um, and his last season that he did really well was 1989. He won five of the first six nationals, or I'm sorry, super crosses. Uh, he lost one. He tipped over at Atlanta and Jeff Stanton won. They went to the outdoor nationals. That was when the outdoor nationals, when they would open it with a round in between super cross. They go to Gainesville. And depending on who you talk to, he either cut under or Danny Storbeck jumped on. I don't know which one. Does it really even matter at this point? It was an accident. Landed on him, broke his wrist, it sucked. He came back that season, but it just, his wrist was never right. He ended up having to retire in 1991. 
and it just it just his wrist is I think he even has like a plastic wrist now. It's really bad. So Rick Johnson, number two on my list. Number one on my list is one of my all-time favorites, David Bailey. David Bailey, I mean, epitomizes style. He he's everything. I mean, as an analyst, as a writer, as every like he's just a guy I completely look up to. David Bailey. Man, I was I was personally devastated when this happened to him. So the 1986 season, David Bailey kind of got handled by RJ. RJ beat him in the 250s. He beat him in 250 Supercross, 250 Outdoors. David did get him in the 500 class in 86, but David really, really, really wanted to step it up and smash him in 87. In preseason at a Golden State National, David had an accident and it's a spinal injury and he's been in a chair ever since and that ended his career and I mean it was a tough one we're all like David Bailey the most precise uh well trained just he's just a guy you didn't think of you know Magoo when he got hurt it was awful but he crashed a lot he, he was a guy that kind of put himself in those situations not David Bailey was like he was so calculated it was just so out of the blue and, and it really shocked a lot of guys and RJ talks about how you know, having it happen to David Bailey, it shook him up. You know, it was like, if it can happen to David, and David was the guy that, I mean, he was the epitome of control, form. So, anyway, David Bailey, number one on the list. But, man, this is a sobering list. As I was putting this together, I'm not going to lie, there's a couple times where I almost teared up. You guys wonder why I take this sport so seriously, and, and we all love it. But we also know there's a very, very dark side to it. There's, there's a lot of danger. We absolutely still do this, and you know, because we like it. But there's, a, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, when I talk about safety, I talk about avoiding stupid. This sport is dangerous, no matter how you slice it. But if we can wear the proper safety gear, if we can eliminate stupid stuff, if we cannot make guys jump 150-foot triples, if we can just manage the stupid stuff. Um, I think we'll all be a lot better off. But anyway, hey, guys, thanks again for listening and watching. And, uh, yeah, like, subscribe, and I'm going to keep putting out content. Thanks, guys. Later.